Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. I remember visiting FaithBridge for the first time and specifically kind of getting a look into student ministry. The thing that was distinguishing to me was that everything that student ministry did had a purpose behind it. I could just tell their heart for students that that was the utmost thing that they cared about and they wanted students to know Jesus. One of my favorite quotes, uh, not because I think it's true, but because it just shows me what I don't want our youth ministry to turn into. Uh, The quote said, youth ministry is nothing more than a holding tank with pizzas. Yes, we want to have fun and yes, we want to eat pizza, and yes, we want to have events and do all those kind of things, but we want our students to know Jesus as their King, and we want to develop students as followers of Christ. What our students are up against today is unlike anything I've ever seen before. Their cell phone, their their constant connectivity, these things aren't inherently bad in and of themselves, but the reality is what those things interface with. All of these things that our students are up against inside a world that says, this is who you're supposed to be, this is what it's supposed to be like, those are those things are so counter Jesus. They feel like there is such a mold that they have to fit into. It becomes difficult for students to fit church and and point break into their lives whenever they have so many other things competing for their attention and competing for their affections. Students are constantly saturated with what what appears to be social uh, surrounding. And yet, loneliness tends to be the number one issue. And the reason is because those, those forms of community that exist in the cloud, that form of community that exists in school, uh, isn't always uh, a grounded reality. But it is amazing to see there is something about the culture here and community that has been established by Jesus that when students walk in on Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings, there is this dynamic that they just feel accepted. This ministry, at least for me, is so exciting and so unique just because we do have such a focus on developing students and on getting students in discipleship relationships. I I don't see many other student ministries doing anything like that where they have such a focus on discipleship. Although we don't see students every day like their teacher does, and although we don't see students every day like a parent would, um, they very much seek out and desire relationships with people here at FaithBridge. That's why we're a ministry of small groups. That's why we are about developing our staff. Our, Our volunteer staff, I call them our staff because we treat them as such. We are dependent on Christ following adults who are willing to enter into students' lives and engage with them on a level that is deeper than you can imagine. We have such an emphasis on community and growing together as a family and and then we have such a huge emphasis on mission to see the world around them as an opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ, to go and to love others the way that Christ loves them. And that for me is one of the most exciting things about the student ministry. Hello and welcome to FaithBridge. My name is Adam McIntyre, and I am the high school pastor here at Faith Bridge. And whether you're here at the Klein campus or at the Woodlands campus or you're watching online, uh, we're so excited that you're here to worship with us today as we launch into a brand new series that we are calling Jesus the Prequel. And our goal, our hope for this series is that we are able to better flesh out the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And my hope and my prayer is that we will also gain a fresh new perspective of the gospel itself. And so over the next few weeks, we will discover together how Jesus fits into the story of Israel in the Old Testament. We will also discover what our roles are in that story. I'm a huge movie buff. I love movies. Uh, If I have a spare couple of hours, you can usually find me watching a movie, and I can still vividly remember the first time that I saw Star Wars. I must have been around five or six years old, and my aunt, who is a huge sci-fi nerd, 
I came over and she sat me down and said, this is the greatest movie you will ever watch. <laughs> and we watched Star Wars A New Hope together. And my life has never been the same since, honestly. It completely changed my world. Up until that point, my favorite movie was Cinderella, which is kind of embarrassing to admit. <laughs> I used to watch it over and over again on repeat. But then after I saw Star Wars, I never watched Cinderella again. To this day, I still have not seen Cinderella since I was about five years old. A glass slipper just can't quite compare with a lightsaber in the mind of a six-year-old child, or in the mind of a 27-year-old child for that matter. And so Star Wars, A New Hope, became the movie that I watched over and over and over again on repeat until a little while later, my aunt comes back over, and this time she brings with her the sequel, Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. And I was so excited about watching that movie. I was so pumped because I love the first one so much. But at the time, as I was watching it, I actually didn't like it all that much. It's my favorite now of all of them. I love it. But it was just so dark in tone. And all, all the main characters were separated from each other, and bad things kept happening to all of them. And Yoda terrified me when I was a kid. And, and then Luke gets his hand cut off by Darth Vader, which just kind of warped me. But then... At the very end of the movie, the big reveal comes, the twist in the story as Luke accuses Darth Vader of killing his father, and Darth Vader says, no, I am your father. Game changer. Right? My, my little six-year-old mind was blown to pieces. I could barely comprehend what I just heard. That can't be right. That's not possible. How could it be that Darth Vader is Luke's father? He literally just cut off his hand. Dads don't do that to their kids. Like, like just, it didn't make sense to me at all. It was a complete game changer. And then later, I find out that Luke and Leia are brother and sister. And again, that completely throws me for a loop. And then when I went back and I watched Star Wars A New Hope again, it was like I was watching a completely different movie. I had a brand new perspective on things. The, the characters were different this time around. I knew them better. They, they were more fleshed out. Their actions had meaning behind it. There's weight and significance to what they were doing. I was no longer just watching what these characters were doing anymore. Now I knew why they were doing it. And the kissing scene between Luke and Leia was way more awkward than the first time I watched it. <laughs> and for a lot of Christians today... The story of the gospel that, that, that they know is that Jesus came to die for our sins so that we can receive forgiveness and have eternal life. And uh, while that is all most certainly true, that's only a part of the story. And for a lot of us, that's really the only part of the story that we know. And so it's like we've been given the big reveal but we don't know much about the actual story. It'd be like if someone came up to us and said, so what's Star Wars all about? Well, uh, Darth Vader is Luke's dad, and they battle each other over the fate of the Empire. Yes, I guess technically that is what the story's about, but that's only a part of the story. It's a crucial part for sure, but you're missing so much of the rest of the story. That's not even close to the whole thing. Why is father pitted against son in the first place? What are they fighting over? What are they fighting for? And what about all the other characters who play such a vital role in the story and who help shape Luke and Vader into who they become, right? If we only know that part of the story, then we are missing the impact that that story can have whenever it's understood properly. And for a lot of Christians, I'm afraid that we miss the impact that the gospel of Jesus Christ can have on our lives because we don't properly understand the story, right? The story of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is so much bigger than our personal salvation. You catch that? Yes, we repent and we accept Jesus as our Savior and we receive eternal life, we receive forgiveness of our sins, but that is in response to the gospel, that is not the gospel. And so what we're going to learn today is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that Jesus is king, here and now. We are going to look at the story of how Jesus becomes king, and we're going to look at why this good news should be a game changer for us. Our hope and our goal is to see the gospel not as a 
me-centric story of our personal salvation, but as a Jesus-centric story of how he came to earth and established his kingdom and claimed his rightful throne as king of all creation. And in order to properly understand the story, we're going to need to go back in Israel's history to the first time that Israel demanded a king. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, uh, just go ahead and raise your hand and usher will come down the aisle and we'll hand you one. And if you don't own a Bible, please keep that Bible. That's our gift to you. So for a long period of time during the early years of Israel's history, one of the things that distinguished Israel from all the other nations was that they considered God himself to be their king. Many of the other nations surrounding Israel were growing and developing and becoming prosperous, and most of them had a monarchy system of government in which they had a single human king to reign over the entire nation. And the people of Israel, they begin to take notice of the way these other nations are operating, and they notice the way that they're growing and they're becoming prosperous and they're becoming mighty, and they have these mighty armies and they're being led by these mighty kings who will lead them to victory in battle. And poor Israel was often on the verge of being conquered by one of these rival nations. And so out of fear and out of impatience, the Israelites demand the prophet Samuel to take a message to God in 1 Samuel 8, 5. They say, now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the other nations. And I want us to look at Samuel's response in verse 6. Samuel says, but, this, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. A more accurate translation of the Hebrew there would be to say, this thing was evil in Samuel's eyes. This request for a human king was evil to Samuel. Samuel could not believe what the Israelites were demanding. You want us to give up our unique identity as a nation ruled not by man, but by God himself so that we can be like all the other nations? God's response is even more heartbreaking in verses 7 and 8. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. You can almost hear the grief in God's voice as he gives in to the demands of the very people he destined to be set apart from all the other nations. They have rejected me as king, God says. Even though I've led them and blessed them and protected them since the days of Abraham. Right? I rescued them from slavery in Egypt using a man with a speech impediment and a stick. I toppled the walls of Jericho using shouts and a trumpet. I just created a thunderstorm so terrifying that the much more powerful Philistine army retreated in fear and confusion. But the Israelites, you see, they were happy to accept God's rescue and God's salvation, but they refused to follow him as their king. And here's the thing about this passage. When we read this roughly 3,000 years removed from this incident, it's easy, at least for me, to turn my nose up at the Israelites. Like, seriously, God has done all these amazing things for you, and you are going to reject him as your king? Seriously? That's what you're going to do? But if I'm in one of those rare moments where I'm brutally honest with myself, I realize that I have witnessed more times than I can count the power that the gospel has to miraculously and completely transform a person's life, and yet, more times than I can count, I have consciously and purposefully rejected that transformation in my own life. Uh, the first time I had this realization was probably around six years ago, when I had just become the youth pastor of a tiny little church, and my youth group was maybe eight to ten high school students. 
And one night, I decided to show them a documentary that was called Adopted Jesus. And this documentary was about a man who was desperately seeking to follow, uh, follow and get to know Jesus. And so he had noticed throughout the scriptures that Jesus kept commanding his followers to serve and love the least of these. And then one verse in particular really struck this man, Matthew 25, 40, when Jesus says, Truly I say to you, whatever you do to the least of these, you do it to me. And so this man decides to sell everything he owns, and he literally made himself homeless, just like Jesus. And then he spent, and now he spends his entire life ministering to and loving and serving the least of these. That's what he does. And about a month after I showed this documentary to the students, one of the parents of the students comes up to me and goes, do you know what our students have been up to? Immediately, alarm bells start going off in my head, right? Like, what do they do this time, you know? And he continues, and he goes, every Saturday, the students have been borrowing my truck, they've been borrowing my cooler and my portable grill, and then they use their money to go out and buy food supplies and water bottles, and then they go find a random bridge, and they set up shop, and then they cook meals for the homeless. Are you kidding me? Like, are they, are they seriously doing that? Absolutely. Last Saturday, they fed over 80 people. I was blown away. I couldn't really believe what I was hearing. I, I had not told them to do any of those things. I didn't give them any kind of challenge after we watched that documentary. They saw the documentary and they realized, oh, that's what Jesus wants us to do. And then they just went out and did it. And none of them even told me about it. That was the crazy thing. There was no, hey, Adam, guess what we did last Saturday? Right? I had to find out from one of the parents what they were up to. The gospel had radically transformed these high school students, and they willingly sacrificed their precious Saturdays and their limited resources to go out and to serve and love and feed the least of these, right? And they were not looking for recognition. They were not looking for praise. They were not looking for a good job. They were simply being obedient to their king. And the idea of ever doing anything like that at all had never even crossed my mind. And if it had, it would have been immediately met with a thousand different excuses. I don't have the time. I don't have the resources. I just don't have the manpower to pull off something like that. I, I don't even know where to go. It might not be safe. On and on and on, the excuses will pile up. And all those excuses can be summed up into one simple truth. I don't want to, right? Like, and that was a hard pill for me to swallow when I first realized that. It was a very eye-opening experience. I had to admit to myself that being obedient like that is inconvenient and it's difficult and it requires sacrifice and I am lazy and I am apathetic and I am fearful and I don't want to. I want to do what the rest of the world is doing and ignore the least of these. And I want to focus on my comfort, my well-being, my security. That's what I wanted to do. Something similar is happening here with the Israelites. They are tired of constantly relying on God for guidance and provision and for protection. And they see the way these other nations are prospering and growing and becoming mighty. And they say, I want that. That's what I want. So God, I don't want to follow you as king anymore. And so God gives them what they want. And eventually David becomes the king of Israel. And with David as king, the Israelites seemingly got exactly what they wanted. Israel actually grew into a mighty and prosperous nation, one of the world-dominant superpowers. And God even made a covenant with David, saying, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Unfortunately for Israel, this success doesn't last for too long. And in the scope of about 400 years, Israel goes from a dominant superpower to a nation that was captured and conquered and enslaved by her enemies. Now, Israel was worse off than when they started. At one point, Israel nearly ceased to exist as a nation altogether. 
And the people of Israel were once again desperate. They were slaves in their own land. And they say that they, never, they haven't felt the presence of God in hundreds of years, a long time. And so here the Israelites were again, and they were longing for rescue from their captives, and they were longing for God's presence to return to them, and they were longing for a new king. But this time, they didn't want just any king. No, they were longing for God to send a final king, a true king, a king who would finally come and conquer Israel's enemies and bring God's kingdom to earth once and for all. What they didn't know was that God already had a plan in motion that can be traced all the way back to his covenant with David. God himself was going to come to earth and claim his rightful throne as king, not just of Israel, but of all creation. And the prophets began to prophesy about this coming king, and their prophecies were often exciting and a lot of times confusing. Some of the prophecies said that this king would come and he would be mighty and powerful and conquering. Others said the king would come and he would be meek and humble. Some said that the king would come and put an end to sacrifice. Others said that he would be the sacrifice. Isaiah 42 describes the king as a servant who will bring justice to all the nations. And then Isaiah 53 says that this servant will suffer for the sins of all. And so for hundreds of years... They waited and they hoped and they prayed for their coming king to come and rescue them. Then one day, after over 400 years of nothing, no communication from God whatsoever, nothing but waiting and hoping and praying, the angel Gabriel shows up to a little city in Nazareth to a virgin named Mary, and we all know the story from there. But what I want us to do is I want us to look at the words of Gabriel here in in Luke 1, 31 through 33. I want us to listen to these words, and I want us to feel the weight and the impact of these words now that we know the story of Israel a little bit better. Listen to this, starting in verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. This is the good news of the gospel that the king who the Israelites have been waiting for and begging for and pleading for for hundreds of years is finally here. Jesus is here. And he has come to claim his rightful throne as king of all creation, and his throne will be established forever. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he proclaims in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news of the gospel. The king is here, and he is bringing the kingdom with him. The plan that God put into motion a thousand years earlier was coming to fruition right before their very eyes. And so Jesus goes about doing the work of building the kingdom of God here on earth, and everywhere he goes, he commits acts of justice and righteousness, and he commands his followers to do the same. He feeds the hungry. He implores the wealthy to open their houses to the homeless. He casts out demons. He heals the sick and disabled. He even goes as far as to forgive sins and to raise someone from the dead. And so even his own disciples were simultaneously amazed and confused at what Jesus was doing. Here was a man who was not only committing the acts of a king, but he was doing the work of God himself. Who has the authority to forgive sin? Who has the power to raise someone from the dead? No one but God. Unfortunately, there were many who rejected Jesus as their king and who were actively working to destroy the kingdom that he was building. See, they wanted their own kingdom, not his kingdom. And his enemies were mounting around him and they were clamoring for his death. And so in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus embraces his role as the suffering servant. And he proclaims, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. 
a direct quote from the prophecy in Isaiah 53. And Jesus is arrested, and he's sentenced to death by the government of Rome, death on a cross as an insurrectionist. And so, during Passover, the time in which the Israelites were to hope for their rescue and for their salvation, many watched their hope for rescue and salvation breathe his last breath. The king of Israel was dead. Can you imagine to have been enslaved and persecuted for so long and to finally have a glimmer of hope only to have it snuffed out right before your very eyes. It must have been absolutely devastating. But then comes the twist in the story. Then comes the game changer. You see, the same God that the Israelites were praising for raising them out of the clutches of Egypt is the same God who raised Jesus from the clutches of death three days after his crucifixion. That is the game-changing moment. That's the big reveal. That's the twist in the story. What seemed like utter and humiliating defeat on the cross was actually the greatest victory in the history of mankind. Jesus was victorious over the one enemy that no human could ever hope to conquer, death. That is the game changer. That is the twist in the story. And it wasn't until after his resurrection that it became clear that Jesus accomplished exactly what he set out to accomplish and exactly what the scriptures had foretold. Jesus did come to defeat Israel's enemies. They just weren't the enemies that Israel was, was expecting. They weren't humans. Jesus came to defeat much bigger enemies. Satan, sin, death. Enemies which have plagued mankind since the very beginning. And a king's victory is a victory for his people. Jesus' victory is our victory. Paul sums it up beautifully in Colossians 1, 13 through 14. Where he says, Jesus has delivered us from the domain of darkness, talking about evil and Satan. And he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. We now belong to the kingdom of God. And he has, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. The blood of Christ covers our sins. That is what our king has done for us. After his resurrection, Jesus proclaims, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So Jesus, Jesus is not just king of Israel. Jesus is king of all creation. And it's our job to go out into the world and spread that good news that Jesus is king, not was, is right now. And our lives should reflect that truth. It should be evident in our lives that we follow Jesus as our king and here again is where we run into the same problem the Israelites faced when they demanded a king. As I illustrated earlier, far too often, I am perfectly satisfied with accepting Jesus as my savior, but I reject him as my king. I want to be a part of the kingdom. I want to be accepted into the kingdom, but I don't want to abide by the king. My wife she, my wife Kathleen, she was in a fender bender a little while ago, and it was a really minor fender bender. She left a tiny little dent in the other driver's back bumper. But even though it was a minor incident, Kathleen played it by the book, and she even called a police officer to come out and to document the whole incident. And while they were waiting for the police officer to come, which took over two hours, Kathleen was able to just sit down and talk with the woman who was driving the other car. And as they were talking, this woman kind of spilled her entire life story to Kathleen and talked about all the different struggles and hard times she had been through. And Kathleen was able to share the gospel with this woman. And then this woman begins to talk about her kids, one of whom was in fifth grade. And Kathleen got so excited because Kathleen is the fifth grade coordinator here at Faithbridge. And she's like, oh, no way, you have to come to Faithbridge. You'll love it here at Faithbridge. You should come. Bring your kids and I'll introduce them to all the other kids in our grade and he'll meet a lot of cool people and he'll love it and you'll love it. Please come to Faithbridge. And when they left, Kathleen was actually really excited after the whole incident, even though she just got in a car accident. She was 
really pumped up about the whole thing because she was just able to share the gospel with this woman who didn't know Jesus as king. And she was able to invite her to come to join this family in Faith Bridge. And the insurance paid for her bumper, and all was well. A few months later, Kathleen gets served some papers. Turns out this woman wanted to sue us for a lot of money for a loss of value to her car. It's literally impossible for me to say that and not sarcastically. I can't do it. I'd never heard of anything like that before. <laughs> and poor Kathleen, she was devastated. But it wasn't so much because of the fact that she was getting sued. She was devastated because she had worked so hard to love this woman and to share the gospel with her, and she kept hoping and praying that she would show up with her kids to Faith Bridge, only to get sued instead. My reaction was quite different. <clears throat> and it can be traced in three simple steps. Panic, anger, and then more anger. I, I was so angry at this whole situation. Like, was this woman serious? You're seriously going to sue us because of a dent in your bumper that we paid to get fixed? Can you even do that? It turns out you can do that. Uh, you can do that. <laughs> and that night, I was just kind of stewing in my own anger. And, and I just found myself wishing that I could exact my own brand of justice on this whole situation. I could go try to find this woman's car and add a few more dents to her bumper, you know? <laughs> add more loss of value to her car. I've never done anything like that. I never would do anything like that, just to be clear. But that just shows kind of the dark place that my mind went and what I wanted first and foremost. But it was Kathleen's reaction that brought me back to reality. You see, I brag on my wife Kathleen a lot because I love her and because she's my wife. But also because when I look at her, I see someone who is truly following Jesus as her king. Yeah, she was upset that she was getting sued, for sure. Who wouldn't be? But she was more upset that her attempt at sharing the gospel did not find fertile soil. Kathleen's first priority, always, is to share Christ as king. She would have fit in well with the disciples who followed Jesus as king uh, before the big game changer, before the big twist ending. See, for Kathleen, Jesus is not just her savior. Jesus is her king. And Kathleen is effective at spreading the gospel because her life reflects what she is proclaiming. And when the gospel doesn't find fertile soil, it's absolutely devastating for her. Kathleen, she cared more about this woman knowing Jesus as king than she cared about the lawsuit. I cared more about the lawsuit. In Philippians 3, 17 through 20, Paul says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction and their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship is in heaven, and, and our king is Jesus. And that's present tense, not future. We are citizens of heaven now. Jesus is our king now. But when, we, when our lives are all about what we want, or as Paul puts it, when our God is our belly, and when our minds are so often focused on earthly things, Power, sex, money, reputation, success, comfort, security. We walk as enemies of the cross of Christ because we are rejecting him as our king. As Christians who are messengers of the greatest news in the entire world, that Jesus is king and that his kingdom reigns right now, our lives have to reflect that truth, and our lives have to show that we are citizens of that kingdom. Right? Otherwise, our words are going to ring hollow. We can't proclaim that Jesus is king if Jesus is not our king. But if we get rid of this me-centric gospel 
and instead we embrace a Jesus-centric gospel in which Jesus is our Lord and he reigns as king over every area of our lives. Then, when we go out into the world and we proclaim that Jesus is king, our words will ring true and his kingdom will spread across all of the nations. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I am just so thankful, so, so thankful for your perfect love for us, your overwhelming love for us, and that you would never, ever, ever give up on being our king. God, and so I pray today, right now, that all of us just feel that conviction to give our entire lives to you and to not just know you as our savior, but to truly follow you as our king. I pray that we all know that we are citizens of heaven now, first and foremost, before all else. And I pray that our lives reflect that truth. God, we love you. And it's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Welcome to Postscript. My name is Tiffany Bell. I'm the Serve Teams Director here at FaithBridge. And today with us, we have Adam McIntyre, who just preached the first uh, sermon in the series, Jesus the Prequel. Thank you for being with us today, Adam. Of course. Adam. So excited to be here. I just have a couple of questions for you from the service. Okay. Um, the first is, you, your first um, script you talk about is Samuel, and then kind of jump almost immediately to talking about Jesus. And yeah. that's a long time in mm -hmm. between that. So how much time is that? And kind of give us a description of what goes on in that time. Yeah, so the, the time from when the Israelites demanded a king to the time where Jesus shows up was roughly about a thousand years. And unfortunately, during the talk, I wasn't able to get into a lot of the meat right. of what was going on there. But I'll try my best to give a real quick summary okay. of what was going on. And so the first king of Israel was actually a man named Saul. And Saul did okay for a little while. He had a couple of victories, but then he very quickly just began to follow his own will and what he wanted to do. And he was completely ignoring the commands of God. And so, uh, so God quickly kind of boots him out of there and actually anoints, actually has Samuel go and anoint David as the king of Israel while Saul was still technically king. And then it wasn't until David was probably around 30 years old that he became the king of Israel. And he reigned over Israel for about 40 years. And, and like I said in the service, everything went well for a while. Israel became a dominant superpower and they were wealthy and prosperous. But David fell into sin, particularly uh, you can see it happen when he gave into his lust for Bathsheba. And then from there it kind of spiraled and you see David become the antithesis of who he used to be. Yet before he was this fearless man who would always go into battle even though he was heavily outnumbered right. and he married honorably and he was always decisive. And then after he gave into his lust for Bathsheba and then he ended up murdering Bathsheba's husband Uriah and then ends up taking Bathsheba as his wife then he becomes indecisive and he refuses to leave his tower and he, he's afraid to go outside. And then he, you see him take a census of Israel to make sure that he would never be outnumbered in battle. And so he kind of turns into this coward. And so you can kind of sin, see what sin did to David. Right. And then that sin kind of ends up unraveling his family. His first son, Absalom, who was supposed to be the king of Israel, ends up leading a coup against David. And David has to retreat and go and hide. And, uh, and eventually David's army ends up killing Absalom, his firstborn son. And it was David's fourth son that he had with Bathsheba, Solomon, who ends up taking his throne. And again, things went okay for Solomon for a while. He actually was the one that finished building the temple, the first temple, and where the Ark of the Covenant was. And, uh, but then he quickly began to worship other gods. And then from there, everything kind of goes downhill um, when the following kings kind of took the throne, Israel actually split into two different nations, Israel and Judah. And then Israel was taken over and conquered by the Assyrians. And Judah ended up, uh, they lasted a little bit longer and they had a couple of good kings, um, uh, Hezekiah, Josiah, people like that. But they also turned from God as well. And they ended up being conquered by the Babylonians 
under King Nebuchadnezzar. And with Nebuchadnezzar, he was the one that went into Jerusalem and burned it to the ground. Every single great building, every single house. Uh, and he went and he stripped the temple of all of its gold and its copper and its silver and then destroyed it. And so that was kind of one of the low points in Israel's right. history when they watched everything they loved burn to the ground at the hands of their enemies. And that was when they were worse off than when they started. Eventually, Persia came in and, and conquered the Babylonians. And Persia was actually not that bad of a nation. They let the Israelites go back to their homeland, even though Persia was in control of them. And they uh, still imposed their laws and taxes and stuff on them. But Persia also practiced freedom of religion. And so that was when the Israelites were allowed to go back and rebuild the temple that the Babylonians had destroyed. But the problem was they were slaves in their own land. They were slaves to Persia. And the temple this time around just wasn't the same. They couldn't feel God's presence in the temple at all. And so that's when they began to long for this new mm. king to come, this conquering king. And it was about 400 years, maybe a little bit over 400 years of nothing on God's part. They didn't hear a word from him before Gabriel came and announced that Jesus, the Messiah, was finally coming. So, yeah, there's a real quick right. summary of what was going on. So, in, in America, I think people often have an aversion to the word kingdom. And right. as you've just said, kings end up, it seems like things just end up not going so well. Yeah. Um, so, why not think of the kingdom of God as a republic instead of a kingdom? Why in this situation is it different? Uh, well, all those other kings, they, those are earthly, those are human kings. And so, of course, eventually their kingdom is going to be toppled. I mean, that's just history. You look right. back in history and uh, there's kind of just this ebb and flow of mighty superpowers rise and then they fall. Even Rome, which was supposed to be the golden age of the earth, eventually is toppled. And um, with Jesus, it's different because he is the one true king. And his, his kingdom that he began during his ministry is still to this day, 2,000 plus years later, thriving and right. growing and expanding. And it's just not the same kind of kingdom that we imagine uh, with like that's physical and there's walls and things like that. His kingdom is one that can be seen um, when his followers are establishing justice and pushing back darkness and loving others in a way that is sacrificial, the same way that Jesus loves others. That is when his kingdom can be seen and that's, what, that's when it grows. But Jesus must be our king. That's, right. that's the only way it's going to work is if Jesus reigns uh, here and now. Otherwise, his kingdom will fail. And so Jesus has to be king. And so a republic really wouldn't work right. in that situation. So you also say um, in your talk that the gospel is more than just our salvation. So right. kind of explain that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, uh, I talked about how for a lot of people, the gospel is the fact that, they're, that Jesus died for them, their sins are forgiven, and right. then they get to go to heaven. Right. And so while that's true on some level, and that's a crucial part of the story, um, what happens when they think like that is, is they, they're missing what it means to be a Christian, to follow Christ as king. And, and so the story becomes about them. And so that's how they live their life. Right. Uh, they think, oh, I'm saved. Uh, I'm good to go. And then they go about doing whatever it is that they want to do. And when they do that, they have no impact on the kingdom of God. And they're not being obedient to Jesus right. as their king. And that's a problem. Uh, the whole reason he came was to bring God's kingdom here to earth. We are saved in response to that kingdom, in response to that good news. But he gave us a very clear command before he ascended to heaven. He said, you know, go about making disciples of all nations, or in other words, go and continue to build my kingdom everywhere. And if we don't see him as a king, if we only see him as a savior, then we are being disobedient to right. our king. And as Paul says, we walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Well, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam, for joining us today. And thank you guys all for joining us today. And we will see you again next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.